bringing some business news now on the programme. COP28 uh, kicking off, of course, this week in the United Arab Emirates. Pressure really on to build global manufacturers to reduce carbon emissions. And Charles Pellegrin, our business editor, is looking at that for us, Sean. That's right, Stuart. And one of the groups uh, piling on the pressure is obviously uh, Greenpeace. Uh, the environmental advocacy group released a new report this Wednesday uh, ringing the alarm on the surge in sales of sports utility vehicles in the past decade. Uh, according to Greenpeace, the popularity of these heavier SUVs is actually offsetting the gains made by the world's top three car makers as they transition to a full electric fleet. Um, SUVs produce more CO2 emissions not just because of increased tailpipe exhaust, but also because they require more steel to be produced, which is a carbon-intensive process. This has led Greenpeace to call for the auto industry to stop what it says is greenwashing. Now, looking at the world's top three biggest car makers, Volkswagen, the German company, has seen its sales of SUVs increase over 270% in the past 10 years. Japanese car maker Toyota and Korean manufacturer Hyundai Kia, uh, meanwhile, have seen their deliveries increase over 150%, 158% for uh, Toyota. For uh, the Korean group, uh, that represents about 52% of its total sales. Moving on now, Virgin Atlantic has become the first airline to complete a commercial long-haul flight without fossil fuels. The London to New York trip instead powered by what the industry calls sustainable aviation fuel a replacement jet fuel made from food waste and biomass. Its production is less carbon intensive than traditional kerosene, but it's far from net zero. Environmental groups calling it, again, greenwashing. Brian Quinn has this. A groundbreaking development for air travel as Virgin Atlantic Flight 100 touched down in New York, having made the flight from London without fossil fuels. The Boeing 787, instead running on so-called sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF, made from waste fats and renewable biomass. Up until about a year ago, it was thought impossible for a long-haul uh, plane going from as, as far as, say, Lon London to New York to fly on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, and we wanted to prove them wrong. Jet engines burn SAF just like kerosene, blasting CO2 into the atmosphere. But the industry estimates that its production results in life cycle emissions that are up to 70% lower. As the climate crisis grows ever more dire, aviation, which accounts for around 3% of global emissions, is considered one of the most difficult industries to decarbonize. SAF currently costs three to five times as much as regular jet fuel and accounts for less than one-tenth of a percent of aviation fuel globally. The UK government and many European airlines are aiming for 10 percent by 2030. Industry goals for net zero emissions will require that to hit 65 percent by 2050. The challenge with sustainable aviation fuel has been that it requires a huge amount of investment, innovation, um, and players across the value chain to make it happen. Environmental groups have called the latest stunt aerial greenwashing, a distraction from the urgent need to immediately reduce emissions by limiting the number of flights. Well, as we mentioned, COP28 kicks off on Thursday in the United Arab Emirates. Among those in attendance will be the International Monetary Fund, which will be at the forefront of financing the transition, the transition to net zero. Uh, the bank's head, Kristalina Gorgieva, has called for an end to business as usual thinking ahead of the talk, saying carbon emissions need to drop 25 to 50 percent by 2030 in order not to exceed a 1.5 to 2 degree increase in temperature. International lenders like the IMF will have to be mobilized to increase lending capacity for uh, climate projects and climate resiliency projects. And will have to step up efforts to help vulnerable countries with their debt burden. Take a listen. What we are very uh, focused on are two questions. The first one is uh, to differentiate the relatively small, thankfully small number of countries where debt distress is already present. And for these countries, 
For seven of them, there is ongoing restructuring process. Uh, there are a couple of countries where we need to find a way to support them uh, to reduce that burden of debt. And let's have a look at the markets now. Uh, all the major indices in Asia trading lower, or closing lower in spite of the U.S. Uh, markets closing higher after a Fed official uh, there made dovish comments about monetary policy and the course of inflation uh, next year. As you can see, the Hang Seng in Hong Kong leading the losses over 2% uh, lower. Uh, and those Fed uh, comments not necessarily giving a boost to European indices either. Uh, at the open, uh, we're seeing in Europe a, a bit of a mixed uh, picture uh, with the DAX continuing uh, its positive trend this month so far, opening the session up a quarter of a percent higher. The Paris CAC 40, though, uh, trading just uh, about flat when it opened uh, this uh, Wednesday morning. And finally, Uber is to open up its platform to London's black cabs early next year. The ride-hailing firm signaling a dramatic turnaround in its relationship with drivers of the British capital's iconic taxis. In recent years, uh, London's black cab drivers blocked the streets in protests against the ride-hailing service. At the, same, at the time, they argued Uber's app-based ordering and demand-sensitive pricing threatened uh, their livelihoods. Well, under the new arrangement, uh, black cab drivers will be offered jobs with a predetermined price range through Uber, uh, which uh, they can accept or reject. Uber will also uh, not charge black cab drivers a commission for the first six months of the deal, Stuart. So there, uh, these two sides are finally uh, mm. bearing the hatchet. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully coming together for once. Thank you for right, Charles Pellegram with the business on France 24.